Welcome to the Epcot International Flower and Garden Festival. Our next presentation explores the magic of seed plant breeding yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Please welcome our garden experts, Dr. Jesse Alt and Eric Heft. Hello, 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 everybody. Hey, everybody. Hello. How are, how are you doing today? Great. Good. Yeah. That's a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah. Appreciate that. That's awesome. That's because you guys are having fun at Disney World and Epcot today. Nice. Excellent. How many gardeners do we have in the group today? A couple, two, three, oh, several, several. Okay, that's wonderful. You're in the right place. There's a lot of plants here. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about plants today. Yeah, so Eric and I, my name's Jesse, and we'll introduce ourselves a little bit more in a minute. Eric and I are actually here on behalf of the American Seed Trade Association, the ASTA. And what makes the ASTA really cool is that it encompasses more than 700 companies. It was founded in 1883, so it's fairly well established. And those 700 companies are related in all aspects of plants. Seeds, plant breeding, turf grass, all seed-related activities are under the ASTA. I could say, I guess you could say we cover everything from A to Z, from alfalfa to zucchini. That's right. Well, when you're here at Epcot, uh, can you imagine what, uh, what it would look like? Um, you know, what is it that, that comes to mind in terms of the beauty that you see around you? I, I bet one of the things that comes to mind is all the amazing plants that we've been seeing outside, like the, the topiaries of, you know, Mickey and Minnie and, and even some of the characters from the Cars movie. Uh, but can you imagine what Disney would look like without plants? You think about it. Every theme, every, every concept in the park is staged with plants, and it would look kind of boring, I think, kind of like the, the picture in the slide, without all these amazing flowers and so on, to set the stage for the ideas and the, and the fun themes that we have here at, at Disney World. Yeah, because here at Disney, you know, they are wonderful storytellers, and we're so excited to be part of that story. So with the Flower and Garden Festival, here every story begins with a plant. For us, every plant begins with a seed, and that's actually where our story begins today that we want to talk about. That's right. But before we get going, you might want to know a little bit more about us. We'll take this minute to introduce ourselves. My name is Eric, and I work for a company called HM Klaus. And we're a vegetable seed company, and we develop new varieties of vegetables from arugula to zucchini and everything in between, peppers, sweet corn, green beans, you name it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a molecular geneticist, which is kind of a... a interesting title. And what that really means is I, I help our plant breeders who are developing these new seed varieties to be better at their jobs by helping them use new molecular genetic tools in their, in their efforts. And uh, I got into plant breeding uh, really kind of young. When I was a kid, my mom had a garden, my grandfather had a garden, and that love of plants kind of rubbed off on me. And now I have the opportunity in my career to work with other plant-loving people to develop some of the most important things uh, for people, and that's new food types and new vegetables that we eat. So it's, it's really a great uh, opportunity. So now that you know a little bit about Eric, my name is Jesse Alt, and I'm a research scientist for DuPont Pioneer. And what that really means is that I'm a soybean breeder. I lead a team of people that develop improved soybean varieties to be sold to our farmers for them to grow on their farm. I got my love of agriculture growing up on a, as a fifth generation on a family farm in Minnesota. I got my love of ag from my dad, obviously, with the generational farm. I got my love of science from my mom. And then as I was growing up, I kind of figured out that I'm an environmentalist at heart and I smashed those three things together and decided to be a soybean breeder. Because by improving soybeans, I can help growers get more out of the same area of land, but do it with fewer inputs and fewer um, environmental impacts. And to me, that's a huge win. So what are plant breeders? You might be thinking, well, gee, what, what are these people? And what do they do? Well, we like to think of ourselves as problem solvers. And for those of you who garden, I'm sure you've all encountered some problems in your garden where, oh, well, gee, my, I don't know, my tomato plant's being infected by some disease or something. Wouldn't it be nice if the tomatoes didn't catch these, these diseases? And that's a nice example of exactly the kinds of things we do. We try to develop new varieties that perform better, that have resistance to disease, maybe resistance to drought, wider uh, adaptation to different climates and that sort of thing. So to help you understand that a little bit better, we want to play a game because, uh, you know, plant breeding has been going on for 
years and years and years, generations and generations, as long as people have been planting plants and eating them, right? And so what we're going to do is ask the audience to guess what the modern vegetable or fruit is uh, when you see its ancient ancestor. So for an example, we have on the screen here uh, the ancient ancestor of modern day banana. And on the right, you can see the banana. You may not have guessed that the thing on the left became through plant breeding activities, the thing you see on the right, right? So what we'd like to do is invite a couple of audience members to come up and volunteer. And what you're gonna do is hold a couple of signs and provide the answers to the question of what is this thing, what did it become? And we'd like the rest of the audience to applaud for the thing that you think is probably what it is, okay? You look like an educated group of folks. We can get this. Okay, so, so we'd like to, you know, get a couple of volunteers. Anybody like to come up? Two volunteers. Would you like to come up? Yeah, okay, oh, right fantastic. there in the front row. We got a couple people in the front. Oh, you said. No, you go ahead. <laughs> she is one of our secret <laughs> She's helpers. She's one of our secret helpers. Right here, right? Yeah, just right in the right middle, that's fine. So, okay, so. Don't hide these until you're told. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. What, what's your name? Ed. Ed, and where are you from, Ed? Chicago. From Chicago. Okay, we got Ed from Chicago. Uh, Gina. Gina? Also Chicago. Uh, also from Chicago. So we've got a couple <laughs> of Chicago folks here enjoying the nice weather in Florida. That's fantastic. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to advance the slide, and we're going to show the next picture, and then you guys can turn your uh, answers around, and we'll ask the audience to applaud with their guesses. So All we've right, got so a couple of... turn around, see turn what around, our see what we options got. are. So you can see this thing. It's got these little red looking like berries on the stem, nice, nice red color. And, you know, we've got a couple answers here. Could it be tomatoes or could it be cranberries? Wow, did this thing become tomatoes or cranberries? Well, let's, <laughs> let's, let's hear it for cranberries. Let's have some here applause for cranberries. Over here. Anybody think it's cranberries? Okay, got okay, some cranberries. Okay, well, let's, how about tomatoes? How many of you think came with tomatoes? No. Oh, very nice. Wow, well, you guys are a smart crowd because guess what? It actually is the ancestor of tomato plants, right? So let's try it again. Next one. Yep, so we have uh, this uh, funny looking green thing here with some little segments on it. From here, I'm looking at, I've got a kind of a cheat monitor up there, but it looks kind of like, I don't know, some funky, funky looking green vegetable or something. What are our <laughs> choices? We got string beans as a choice or corn. Wow, that's kind of a different mix. So who thinks it's string beans that this thing became string beans? Anything? Okay, we got yeah, one, one, one vote one for string one beans in the soul. back, okay? How about corn? Anybody think it became corn? Yep, okay. Okay, it looks like corn's the winner. You guys are a smart crowd, because guess what? That is, that is the fruiting structure of teosinte, which yep. is the ancient ancestor of modern-day corn. And I have to say, you guys are doing much better than the morning audience. Kudos, I mean, <laughs> really. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah. All right, let's try this again. We have this funky-looking thing, uh, kind of an interesting-looking fruit. Almost looks like a tomato to me, but uh, what do we have as our choices? It could be an apple or a peach. Okay, who's for peaches? Who's for peaches? Ancient ancestor of peaches. Okay, we got a few Lu claps. We got lukewarm claps for peaches. Lukewarm claps for peaches. What about apples? Anybody think this is apples? Okay, we got, so we got some more? promoters here. Okay. We, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I'm sorry to say that we're playing a trick on y'all because, in fact, these are, this is the ancient ancestor of eggplants. And for yeah. those of you who are gardeners, you all know what that is. But that's an interesting purple uh, vegetable that we, we have a lot in, in Asian cuisine, right? Yeah. And if you want to see a great example of eggplant, haven't been to the land yet. They have them growing in hydroponics, and they are gorgeous over there. Yeah. So for you guys, okay, you've, you've already gone too fast. You may as well turn your next one around. Because <laughs> I was going to say, who could possibly okay. guess that something that had red flesh and black seeds could become... Watermelon. Watermelon. We thought y'all would gather, <laughs> guess that one. So, <laughs> so we were going to play a trick on y'all, but you're too fast for us. But that's all right. So, so exactly right. So these uh, these watermelons, you know, kind of a funny looking thing on the left hand side, especially that uh, small fruit in front, became what we know and love as as watermelon today. We eat it at our barbecues and on the Fourth of July. It's just fantastic. Well, I'd like to also say if. Um, did you know that if you're planting one of these modern varieties of seedless watermelon, you'll have better luck getting more fruits if you also plant one of the seeded types uh, next door because the seeded types will provide a nice source of pollen and give you more fruit set on the seedless vine. Yeah, and also did you know, so I have two small kids, and one of them asked me about a year ago, Mom, why is it called watermelon? And we did a little research, and we found out that in older times, especially in the desert, 
people would carry watermelons with them, and when their camels got thirsty, they'd slice them in half, mush up the insides, and the camels would drink it up as an actual water source, a melon that was actually used for water, yeah. hence the name. That's yeah. great, and I think if you were out in the middle of the Syrian desert, which is, I think, the center of origin for watermelon, yeah. you'd probably want to find one or two of those, too, if you ran out of water, right? All right, let's try this again. We've got another one, this, uh, this flower, this yellow flower on the left. And we've got a couple of choices. What did this become? Uh, we've got a choice of cabbage and kale, okay? So who thinks, who thinks it's the, the ancestor of cabbage? Can we get some applause for cabbage? All right, little All applause right, for cabbage. All right, we got a good applause for cabbage. That's pretty good. How about kale? Anybody for kale? Oh, a little more kale enthusiasm. Okay. All right. Well, well, it turns out that you guys are all right. And so this is kind of another trick because this is wild mustard you see on the left. And through plant breeding, it became kale, cabbage, kohlrabi, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower. So it's an amazing source of a number of different vegetables that we all uh, enjoy today. So really cool that this, this ancient ancestor became so many different things. All right, last one, guys. Let's finish strong. Last one. So this is a root crop. And you see on the left, there's this kind of a brown-looking root with some branches. What did this thing become? <laughs> We've got a couple of choices here. we got sweet potato and we have carrot. Uh, who's for sweet potato? Who's for, okay, we got, we got some people like sweet potato pie in the audience maybe. Okay, sweet potatoes. How about carrots? Anybody for carrots? Okay, well, some, okay. Up. Well, you know, that was a hard one, but um, there it is. It's carrots. <laughs> it's carrots. Did you get them? Did you get them? That's great. <laughs> That's great. You don't give me as a prize. Oh, I know you don't give me as a prize. I'm sorry. I've got to fly home tomorrow. If you if you stay, stay <laughs> but I'd love to stay here longer. That'd be fantastic. Okay, if you stay with us till the end, everybody gets a prize. <laughs> Just a little teaser. That's right. That's right. We will have a prize for you in in a few minutes. Yeah. All right, well, y'all, uh, that's the last of our examples. Thanks so much for participating today. Thank you. Let's today. have a round of yeah, applause for Yeah, can we have some volunteers? applause for our volunteers? Thanks very much. Thanks very much. All right. Well, you know, it's really interesting how these ancient ancestors of modern-day plants, you know, gave rise to all these fruits and vegetables that we know today as consumers. But, you know, it's, this didn't happen by accident. It, wasn't, it didn't just happen like uh, you saw in the video. It was the result of plant breeding. Yeah, and so for us as plant breeders working on seed, this is really where our story begins that we want to share with you today. And plant breeders have been improving varieties for generations. I mean, you guys saw the before and afters. That took a lot of time. And what you also see up there is a nice diversity. And plant breeders really were all about working through diversity and maximizing it. And, you know, through all the time, it started out pretty slow, where if you wanted bigger tomatoes, you would keep your biggest tomato and plant that seed next year. And over time, if you kept doing that sl slowly but surely, your tomatoes would get slightly bigger. Now with plant breeding, we've done a lot of innovation to do what we can to speed that process up. Instead of it taking generations, it can now take years to make improvements. And that's resulted in things like 10,000 different varieties of tomato, and sweet corn that we enjoy at our summer barbecue. And I know for me, I've only tried about 10 varieties of tomato in my garden. Kind of excited to see what the other 9,000 and some hold. Yeah, that's a lot of diversity. And that diversity really is the important uh, factor there. You have all this different variation that you can then select through. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun for plant breeders. We love diversity. So seed improvements are driven by consumer demand, grower and gardener needs, and farmer needs through evolving innovation. And last summer in my garden, as I mentioned, I have two little girls. And so we planted one of those mixed packets of carrot seed where it had white carrots and yellow carrots and orange carrots and purple carrots all mixed together in one packet. And my girls loved that. And so my little consumers this year are demanding colored carrots, mixed packet of seeds. It's the only kind of carrots that's going into our garden. One of my little consumer demands. So we'd love to hear from you. A lot of you are probably plant people here for the Flower and Garden Festival. What would be on your wish list? What would you like to see from either produce in the store or plants that you grow in the garden? What would be some of the things that you would like improved in your plants? Any ideas? Oh, here we go. Oh, high nutrient content. That's, that's a great idea. Yep. Any others? Yes, sir. Ah. Yeah, 
watermelon and pumpkins that don't need so much space. Yeah, that's yeah. that's also a good idea. Cabbage that doesn't smell when you cook it. You, you know, are the first one to say that today. You know, yeah, that, that's great. It's really interesting that you say that because when I was a kid, my mom used to make all kinds of cabbage and stuff, and it used to stink up the whole house, and I didn't like any of those coal crops. And nowadays, broccoli is my, my girl's favorite f favorite vegetable, and I think that the plant breeders have done a nice job of breeding out some of those sulfury smells that are in some of these. So they're doing that, and they're getting better at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have to work on cabbage. <laughs> I kind right, of agree with you. Right. Have to work on cabbage. <laughs> Anything else on the wish list out there with our audience? Yeah, I have a strong lettuce project. Just clipping all year. So the, the answer is strong lettuce or lettuce that's tough that maybe you can clip back and yeah. keep coming all year long. Right. Yep. Also a nice thing. Yep, absolutely. Yes. Uh. Yeah, the, so the fragrance back in the strawberries, getting a little more aromatics back with some of our strawberries. Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think what's happened is uh, plant breeders, plant breeders have yeah. selected for some of the other characters that that our society demands, like transportation ability and, and shelf life. <laughs> And maybe they've neglected some of the things like the flavor and the and the, the odor that we recognize from certain foods. So it's it's a great point. I know that we're working on coming back with the flavor and the smells that we associate with some of our favorite fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Yes. All right. The comment is if you buy fresh from Florida, you're going to get all that because they're, they're in season. season. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yep, so year-round, we would like to have that type of freshness with our strawberries. Yep. yep. Yes. So improved flavor in watermelons, especially the ones that are coming to the market right now. Yep, well I can guarantee you we're working on that. <laughs> I can guarantee yeah. it. So this has been really great, and we have heard a lot of really good things on your wish list. And the fun thing, like Eric and I have given a little bit of feedback already, this is wonderful because consumer wish lists are what goes into what plant breeders do. Eric and I just don't sit in our office and come up with weird ideas. It's responding to consumer demands. I guess you can speak for yourself. Sometimes <laughs> I come up with some kind of crazy ideas. <laughs> In my office. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So there's two pictures up on the slide. One is my girls and I in our garden last summer. And then on that same day is out in one of the soybean field trials at work. And you know, the three biggest things that I fret about in my garden are weeds, bugs, and disease. And you know, the three biggest things that farmers ask me to help them with in their soybean fields are weeds, bugs, and disease. <laughs> Very informed front row today. That's right. That's right. And you know, a great example of this for me is um, I end up with uh, squash bugs every year in my squash. And all winter I do research on what I can do, different varieties or different management practices, what I can do to manage them. And yet every year I still end up spraying for the little buggers. And I think to myself, I wish this squash plant had something in it that the insects didn't like, that they'd just give it a sniff or something and walk on by. And the fun thing is that as a commercial plant breeder at work, I have been able to help farmers with their soybeans on bugs. We have just a native trait in soybeans that has made the soybeans resistant to soybean aphids. So the aphids land, don't like it, and they just fly away again. It's just a non-preference type of thing. And it's a huge win for the growers because their protection is built right into the plant and then they don't have to spray. So it's less insecticide in the environment. Now, if I could get Eric to hook me up with a squash breeder for the squash bugs. Yeah, I'll have to talk to Sarah about that okay. and, and let her know. We've been hearing about that for a while, so it's kind of burned in. <laughs> when I go back, we're going to talk about squash bugs. All right, well, there's a, a did, did you, you know, know here. Right, so I talked about, you know, in my garden, I scout for weeds, bugs, and disease pretty much every <coughs> week. I'm out there doing different things. Sometimes at the season, it's daily. 
But actually, our trials at work, we take care of them just as well as we take care of our garden. We actually scout them weekly as well for weeds, bugs, and disease, try and prevent and get ahead of any problems we might be seeing. That's right. <coughs> so the question was, with the squash bugs, is that, yeah, yeah. If there was other plants that we could put, I could put by my squash to keep the bugs away. Um, personally, I've tried marigolds, haven't had a lot of success with them, so I don't know. If anybody has any other ideas on my squash bugs, come on up afterwards and please tell me, because it'll be, that'll be great. <laughs> yeah. So, um, right, so onions work with carrots. The, um, unfortunately for the area that I'm in, the squash bugs are a very determined, plentiful critter. So, yes. Um, yes, sir. So the question was, in, one of the, in the picture, it looked like it had some things going vertical. And I admit to growing way more um, gourds than I should. And so to save <coughs> on space, I send them up instead of sending them out. Because like you wanted space saving watermelon and pumpkin. So since I didn't have that for the gourds that I wanted, I just ran them up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do it with tomatoes too. It's been great. Yeah. So this has been a lot of good innovation we've talked about already. So our breeders and researchers continue to improve yep. plant breeding processes to create more desirable seed varieties. And a lot of it, you as an audience have already covered, improving things like our sight, our touch, taste, smell. Those are all things that we work on as plant breeders. And we do it, it's a fairly straightforward process, but it takes us a while. Yep. Where we plant out seed, we sort through the different plants for the sight, taste, touch, and all the characteristics that you all have mentioned already. And then we cross the winners together to make the next generation. It's just selecting in that variation. There's a lot of quality control that actually goes into that. That's right. And so did you know? Did you know um, a lot of the seed lots come with quality control on them, a germination rate? So seed is actually a living thing, and living seed doesn't actually like to get too hot. And a lot of you probably know this already, but if you get seed in over the winter, like I tend to do, I tend to order seed on the coldest day in January, and then I get it like January 10th. Um, I just tuck it into the fridge in the basement and so it stays nice and cool and is not out on a really hot shelf somewhere. It's kind of interesting, those cold winter days, that's when I'm going through my seed catalogs too. And it just kind of reminds you of spring. It's a great thing to do in the middle of winter, isn't it? It is. <laughs> yeah. Well, good deal. Um, let's see what's next. Oh, well, we're going to tell a little story about how plant breeders really use the selection process that Jesse's talking about, like saving the bigger fruit and so on to get the bigger tomato. Well, the way this works for bre breeders is uh, the response to selection. There's a, a, a theme here called response to selection, and we employ it all the time. So I'm going to tell a story about the peppered moth, and some of them may, kn may know this story, so don't, don't tell everybody else the answers here. But back in the 1800s, this peppered moth um, existed mostly as the uh, white version with the, the speckles on the wings around Manchester, England. And it's the same town where Manchester United came from, if anybody likes soccer, okay? But around Manchester, in the woods around Manchester, these moths were often found, and they would, you know, rest on the branches and stems of trees that were covered with lichens, these light-colored lichens, right? Well, guess what happened in the early 1800s? The Industrial Revolution and the development of a lot of factories that produced all these things that people need, but also produced a lot of smoke and soot. And so what happened was, in the woods around Manchester, those light-colored lichens started to get darker and darker from all the soot in the air, okay? And I got to tell you, if you're a light-colored bug sitting on a dark-colored branch and there's a lot of hungry birds around, it might become lunch. And that's exactly what happened. The birds could easily find the, um, you know, light-colored bugs on those kind of darkened colored uh, branches. And so they would more easily find them as their food source, and that meant there were fewer light-colored bugs to pass their genes on to the next generation. But the dark-colored ones that blended in better to their surroundings now uh, became more frequent in the population, and they were able to pass their genes on in higher frequency to their, to their children. And so over a number of generations, what happened was the moth uh, changed from what was pretty much all white and with that uh, speckled color 
to almost 100% dark, like the one on the right-hand side. So that was a response to selection in the moth population. The birds were doing the selection, and the moths were responding with the change of their color. And what's really interesting is we got smart as people about the factories and we cleaned them up, and now they don't pollute like they did in the past. And so what's really neat about the peppered moth population is when that smoke was less prevalent and you had less of that soot and so on around Manchester, the lichens got light again. You know, and now the population of peppered moths has reverted back to that original uh, light-colored speckling. So let's see, there's, uh, I want to just continue with that story and help you think about selecting and responding to selection as a plant breeder. Now we have modern tools. Jesse talked about selecting some of the things we can see in the diversity of our breeding populations. But now we have uh, this other tremendous resource of genetics available to our plant breeders to make what they do even more efficient. So who here has heard of the Human Genome Project? Anybody? Yeah. Got okay. a couple people. Quite a few people have probably heard of the Human Genome Project, right? And it was only back in 2003 that the human genome was sequenced. It's not so long ago, really. And since that time, virtually every crop, not all, but almost every crop or vegetable genome has also been sequenced. And so now, plant breeders have um, not just this visual aspect that they can select with, but they also have the power of genetics to use as tools to enhance their, their breeding program. And how do they do that? Well, you know, your genome or your, your genes and your DNA uh, really hold the secret to, to life. And that secret, those genes are spelled out in codes just like words in a book. And so if you think about it, I like to think about it in terms of cooking. When you're following a recipe, you know, the recipe calls for or eggs or sugar or flour or whatever when you're making cookies. Well, just like that, your, your organism reads that secret code, reads those words, those genes, and tells the organism what to be. So that's how we all became who we are is through our genes. And what we can do is use variations in the spelling of those words, right, to follow certain genes through our population. So instead now of having to observe things like disease tolerance or some things that are very difficult to observe like enhanced um, uh, strawberry f smells and things like that, if we can figure out what the genes are related to those, now we can take a sample of DNA from our segregating populations and follow those genes through and select for them without having to do really um, more challenging and difficult experiments to figure out what things smell like or how resistant they are and so on. So they're like a bookmark in your cookbook, those changes in the spelling of the words, and we can use that information to track these traits through our populations. And so you can probably tell Eric and I are pretty excited about things. And you can tell us what are the four things that yeah, plants so tie into. That's right. So what, why does all this matter? Well, it turns out, and I, I hope you caught the beginning video of, of our show here today, because all the things that impact our quality of life, a huge proportion of them, really just start with a seed and how we can improve that. So it influences the food we eat, you know, the clothes on our backs, the air we breathe, our houses, everything starts with seeds. It's incredible. And so that's why we're excited about it. It, it really has a huge impact on people. Uh, and plant breeding is really, therefore, kind of a fun thing to do. So here's a did you know. We were talking about getting by with less. Jessie mentioned that with her soybean example where now growers don't have to spray an insecticide to take care of an aphid that was quite, or I can't remember what it was. It was a aphid, right? Yeah, aphid. Yeah, soybean Little aphid. tiny pin pin-sized insects yeah. that cause tremendous problems. Yeah, so we're talking about doing more with less and maybe trying to conserve. Well, just another tip, and there's a lot of gardeners, so you all probably heard this before, but when you're establishing your garden in the spring, um, you, what you want to do is not water every single day necessarily when you're establishing your garden. Instead, you're better off doing a, a deeper and less frequent irrigations so you can establish a nice root, nice root system. If there's a lot of water, the plant will respond and not put down as nice a roots, right? And so what happens then is if you're overwatering early when the summer gets hot and you have those high temperatures, the plant can't adapt to that as well. So you get a better crop if you do less frequent deeper waterings in the springtime so that in the summer you'll have a more productive uh, garden. So let's see here. <coughs> so Eric and I are obviously really excited about plants and really excited about seed. And we're excited about what's on the horizon. And we have one more thing where we need a volunteer from the audience. So brave volunteer. You, sir, come on up. We actually get to go up on stage in the kitchen. <laughs> That's going to be great. 
What a brave volunteer. <laughs> Come on around this way, please. So what's your name, sir? Dennis. Dennis, and where are you from? California. California, wonderful. All right, so we are going to talk about how much an earth kind of looks like an apple. So why Eric and I are excited about seed improvement is that there's only so much land on the earth that we can use to grow food. And so I will have you demonstrate for me on our earth. So we'll start with our earth. Can you hold it up so everyone can see it? Okay, so there's our earth, if the whole earth. However, we can't grow food where we don't have land necessarily. And so three quarters of our earth is water. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna shave down your earth. We're gonna get rid of the water part. And so right off the bat here, our earth has shrunk where we can grow food. Can you hold that up for everyone to see? So now we're down to just a quarter where we can actually grow food. Unfortunately, <laughs> I need your piece back because I'm going to cut this in half again. Right, you've done this before. Not this. Not this. Okay, so you want to hold this up because not all of our land can actually support food. Glaciers, deserts, mountaintops cannot grow food. However, I need your piece back. And I'm going to very carefully cut this into four smaller pieces. Does anyone have a guess on why I need to cut this into such small, tiny pieces? Urban areas. Urban areas. Who said that? Somebody say, okay, that's. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat. Right. And so the answer is out, and the audience knew. The answer is out. And there are, so took out the urban areas where we live, took out you know, our houses and our schools and that's our right. churches and our parking lots. So we're down to 1 32nd of our apple. However, I need it back again because I need to slice it down a little bit more. So we can only grow food, not through all of that, but just through the topsoil. So can you hold that up? So out of that whole earth that we started with, this is all the arable land that we have to produce food. And so when you think about all the people that we're going to add to the planet, all the seed improvements that we can do, that's why we are so excited about the magic of seed and what we can do. So thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. Yeah, Give them a round of applause. Yep, and that's really what's on the horizon is being able to do more with less and being able to feed a hungry planet that's growing in population. And so there's several other benefits that we kind of talk about on the horizon as well. There's environmental benefits. We've touched on several of them. Maybe plants that can do more with less water, less nutrients. Um, we have consumer benefits, talked about improved taste and flavor, things like that. Nutrition. Nutrition, yeah. 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 Improved yeah. grower benefits, like plants that could do more with less, perhaps right. less water, if you sp think about small farms in developing countries. So we're very excited about what's on the horizon, but the horizon goes up. What That's do we right. have next? So the horizon does go up, and for those of you who are looking for a prize at the end of the show, we've got uh, a little magic of seed to send home with you all. And we're giving out some tomato seeds, but I have to say these aren't just any tomato seed. These tomatoes have been in space, and they're part of the Tomato Sphere project. And so I just learned, actually, for this presentation yep. that these tomatoes have gone up in space, and then they're given to uh, grade school children so they can learn to start doing scientific experiments. So they'll plant out the ones that have been to space and maybe the same variety that hasn't been to space to see if space does anything to seeds, right? So kind of cool. So there's a website on the seed packet, I believe, or maybe one of the cards that uh, our helpers are passing out that tell you how to find the Tomato Sphere website and learn all about the project. But we, we hope that you uh, can take some of this magic of seed home with you and spread the word to some of your friends. And if you don't garden, you can still have a package of seed that went to space. That's pretty cool, <laughs> right? It is. And you know, there's um, a lot of the things that we've talked about are actually planted here on site. There's a ASTA garden out in front of the land pavilion. So if you want to stop by and if you're like me and I didn't discover kale till a couple of years ago, but if you want to go see kale growing in person or corn, it's out in front of the land pavilion, stop on by and see it. And if you want to chat with us once you get back home, you can just tweet us at better underscore seed. We'd sure love to hear from you. That's right. Well, we'd like to thank you very much for coming and hearing about uh, the magic of seed today. And if you've got any more questions, we'd be happy to entertain them now. Yeah.